I am the research director for the Iowa Department of Corrections. This is not my curriculum, but I drew the straw to come and present this to you today. Uh, the uh, person who would have otherwise been here, who uh, was a major contributor to the curriculum, just had a baby, and she is about to resume um, classes at Iowa State University. Um, she's a, a professor there. So um, here uh, is a, a list of everyone that has been involved in uh, the active curriculum. This project started with the Judicial Branch's Domestic uh, Abuse Office and a Violence Against Women Act grant. Um, and so on their initiative, uh, two of our judicial districts, we have eight in the state of Iowa, uh, Departments of Correctional Services, uh, found a partnership with the University of Iowa, Erica Lawrence and um, her students at the time, Amy Zarling and Rosora Orengo Aguayo, um, worked with us to um, develop this curriculum. The uh, University of Iowa received a um, Centers for Disease Control uh, grant to um, do the evaluation for this program. And uh, Amy Zarling, who has since earned her PhD and is teaching at Iowa State University, um, is completing um, that evaluation. So uh, we also had um, the uh, Iowa Domestic Abuse um, Program folks, um, uh, ICADVA, the Iowa Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Uh, Kristen Feisel was part of the uh, planning and implementation group, and she continues um, to be involved in that. So. so we sought to improve the program outcomes in 2009. Um, we collaborated, this is just uh, discussing, I guess I already discussed what's on this slide. Um, so we developed uh, the Achieving Change Through Value-Based Behavior, otherwise known as ACTIVE. So studies with violent offenders show that these individuals negatively evaluate the experience and expression of emotions, show an inability to tolerate one's own, one's own and others' negative emotions have poor empathic accuracy with others' thoughts and feelings, and aggression provides a short-term distraction from those emotions. So um, the University of Iowa and us thought that um, it was worth it to uh, try uh, ACT to in ACT principles to domestic violence. ACT stands for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, and it was developed uh, by Stephen Hayes and others. Um, so what this curriculum does, it's, it seems well suited to the broad emotional skill deficits that characterize domestic violence offenders that we just saw in the previous slide. The inability, it addresses the inability to engage in adaptive goal-directed behavior when distressed, and it addresses the lack of awareness, understanding, and or acceptance of one's own emotions. So we are the first to um, uh, develop a curriculum and implement it uh, that uses these principles um, to treat domestic abusers, male domestic abusers. So these are the processes. Um, acceptance um, explores futility of emotional control and avoidance. Uh, which can increase distress and deter from engaging in purposeful and vital value-driven behavior. Diffusion involves a radical shift in context where thoughts are observed events rather than literal truths that must dictate behavior. You don't have to act on your thoughts. Mindfulness or being in the present moment. Um, so we build awareness of what is being express, experienced in the present moment. Um, People are being taught that their thoughts can come and go. They don't have to control behavior. So this doesn't intend to stop thoughts. It's intended for people to become aware of them and know that they don't have to act on them. Self as context builds awareness of the observing self, where people come to realize they can let go of unhelpful self-evaluations and retain a sense of self. You're a bad father. I'm worthless. You know, these are the kinds of labels that um, people can shed 
if we know that if they develop a sense that beyond these labels is a core self. Values. People in ACT learn to choose willingness to experience difficult thoughts and feelings in order to engage in valued behavior. So they learn to be uncomfortable and to be uncomfortable as they change. And finally, committed action. ACT helps people see that they must choose this valued direction over and over again. For example, after failure, pick yourself up, keep going. Um, these are the active sessions. There are 24 of them. This is an open curriculum, so, and it needed to be that way because we have um, uh, men jumping into the program and they need to start wherever the group is starting and then they'll cycle through. So we have um, a big picture uh, of the program that gets reinforced and reiterated um, so that it's, it's a uh, reinforcement for the offenders who were in the program from the beginning or for the men jumping in in the middle of a particular cycle. Um, they, they get the big picture and then they get on, go on. Um, so there are barriers to change, um, substance abuse, um, behavior on our children, learning to be a warm and nurturing parent and how moods and uh, stress affect our behavior. So there's a barriers to change curriculum or a, a part of it. Emotion regulation skills are part of this program. Cognitive skills are part of this program. And behavioral skills are part of this program. So active at a glance, 24 weekly sessions um, about an hour and a half to two hours per group. Uh, the facilitator style is collaborative, non-judgmental, and it focuses on experiential learning. It also does not lecture. I remember Amy Zarling saying recently um, that um, when she was um, um, observing facilitators, there's a coaching part to um, uh, our facilitators. She said, no one should be talking 10 minutes about anything. It's about uh, providing a space for the men to experience and to practice and to learn these skills. So it's very collaborative. And the goal is to learn the emotional skills and increase valued behavior for these men. Um, so we have a large study. These are preliminary results. There, we followed um, 848 men who received active and 2,800 and change who received our treatment as usual, old program. So what we found, this is the intent to treat sample, which um, uh, researchers at the academic level prefer, whether they're failures or successes. This is the um, graph for the intent to treat sample. Um, and we looked at any new charge uh, tracked through the Iowa District Court database. Um, the participants in active, 30% had any new charge, 48% for treatment as usual. Domestic abuse assault rates were cut pretty much in half, from 8.6% active, uh, treatment as usual, 16%. Any violent charge, that's a little bit larger than any domestic abuse, 12.6% active, 35% treatment as usual. And then we looked at violation of no contact orders, 1% for the active men, and 4.6% um, for treatment as usual. And then the next slide, because people in my business like to look at just the treatment completers, because is it fair to track um, folks through programs if they're failing? So here's the uh, treatment completers data. Any new charge? 22%, 21.7% for the active men, 43.6% uh, for treatment as usual. Domestic assault, 5% versus 14%. Any violent charge, 8.2% versus 23%. Violation of no contact orders, 0.4% for the active men, 3.6% for treatment as usual. Um, this track, tracking time was from inception of the program, their first start date, and up to a year after their program was completed. So um, approximately an 18-month follow-up overall. 
So the preliminary evidence for active effectiveness compared to treatment as usual was that active significantly improved general recidivism and cut domestic assault recidivism in half. Active did the best reducing violent charges overall, overall a two-thirds percent redu a two -thirds reduction. Active did not reduce time to new charges. I took this from Amy Zarling's um, larger, very research-based, um, and she uh, also had many slides having to do with um, the new charges. It didn't reduce time to new charges. Uh, when active participants did reoffend, they had significantly fewer charges. Yes. Did you see more people complete the active uh, curriculum versus the treatment? Um, I believe no. I believe no. Uh, I can get that answer for you. Um, since I'm not the um, lead researcher on this and nor did I design the curriculum, you're likely to be asking questions of me today that I will be happy to follow up on and provide a written response to the task force. Uh, what do you think of the research and what can you do in your area? Mm-hmm. So in uh, Iowa, um, there were um, facilitators who had received uh, the Duluth model training. Um, we also, over time, developed um, what we called the Iowa addendum that had cognitive behavioral treatment. I'm not sure that it's fair to say that we did just Duluth because is there program drift over time? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, we didn't go in and look and see, you know, what people were doing, doing and with so many facilitators across the state, um, they were doing things differently in their own areas. So you give people the tools, but then you don't do quality assurance or coaching, and, and over time, uh, things can kind of fall apart. In Iowa, who operates the programs? Um, so the, uh, there are eight judicial district departments of correctional services. Um, in some areas of the state, the uh, staff of uh, probation parole officer staff are trained facilitators, and um, they are the ones who facilitate the programs. Um, some of them uh, have their names on this curriculum today. Elaine Bales, Lori Traeger, they're our staff uh, for, the, for the districts. Um, there are areas of the state where they contract with outside agencies, and that's what they do. They love doing it. And those um, uh, folks, too, are, um, have learned active, I believe, in um, Sioux City. So our, uh, the contractors are learning, are learning to be trained facilitators as well. Currently, about 80% of our state is active versus our treatment as usual. And I think that um, probably within a year, the entire state will be all active. Okay. Um, and what are the requirements to be a facilitator? Um, we have a, I believe it's a two-day training, maybe a three-day training that is required. Um, there are uh, follow-up uh, observation and coaching sessions. And are there any educational requirements of the individual's? Who become facilitators. I can get that for you. Okay. And um, are the people um, who go into the group assessed uh, prior to being in the group uh, for whether they're going to, the likelihood of their uh, success in a group? Um, we know that uh, these are all court ordered folks, mm -hmm. so we have to take them. All, so you just take everybody? We have to take okay. them because they are court ordered to complete domestic abuse treatment. There okay. is an intake procedure. Mm -hmm. Knowing our eight districts, intake in the eight districts may be a little different. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I can uh, ask uh, our folks um, to uh, provide a description to this task force of what kinds of assessment or intake what that looks like. Okay. And I I have one more. I could go on. Go but on. I, no. Uh, what happens if somebody doesn't show up for group? So there are uh, varying attendance policies. 
Um, uh, it could be that um, you know, one or two missed classes doesn't mean that you're kicked out of the group. Um, we do have um, folks who need to go to jail because of noncompliance issues, and we put them in jail short term. Um, if they restart the program within 60 days, uh, we don't count that against them as a failure. We just, you know, put them back in the program. It is uh, required that they complete this program, so uh, the districts make every effort um, to get these people back in the program at some point. Um, of course, we have um, some folks being uh, revoked to prison to serve their prison time. Um, and in prison, we have a different kind of program called the Moderate Intensity Family Violence Prevention Program developed in Canada. Um, right now, we are about to pilot an active segment in our Fort Dodge Correctional Facility um, to see how it works there. Um, so they need to complete. Um, we have offenders who uh, have been required to complete domestic violence programming for years and somehow they never make it through and we keep putting them through because we must try. I have two questions. Do you engage with the victim at all or any communication through any agency about this process with the offender? And uh, do you have separate levels of um, groups for high-risk offenders and other offenders or is everybody in the same pot? Uh, we have talked about uh, the need to separate our offenders based on risk. Um, and um, we now have an Iowa Violence and Victimization Instrument um, that, um, that's my specialty area, is offender risk assessment, um, that predicts um, the likelihood of violence in the general offender population. And it does provide um, correct prediction for um, domestic abusers as well. So um, we've talked about the need for that. I think reality and the practical nation, na the practical aspects of getting um, our offenders into the classes is that historically we have allowed offenders to choose their schedule when it would be most convenient for them to come in and do class. Um, it is not ideal. We would love to separate um, the offenders based on risk. Um, what I've heard from uh, my much more um, knowledgeable colleagues on the matter is that the low-risk offenders, when they are exposed to high-risk domestic abusers, you know, sort of cop the attitude that, oh, well, at least I'm not that bad. And that doesn't really do much for addressing their own offending um, profiles. Um, have we solved that yet? No, I'd love to. We would love to. Um, I found a few articles that made it sound like this is primarily done in prisons, but you also made it sound like it's done out, but they could be facing prison. Can you address kind of yes. what their legal situation is? This is a community-based program, okay. community-based corrections program. We receive um, offenders who are not, um, uh, we, we receive offenders who are uh, uh, court ordered to probation, and um, that is primarily the makeup of this population probation, or the judge does not um, uh, order formal supervision, but does order the classes. So we have hundreds of offenders coming to our classes who we do not supervise. They have no correctional supervision status of probation for us, but we teach, we, we teach the classes to them as well. So this is a pre-prison, pre-jail program. We have, um, in Iowa, we have a unified district court that handles lower level misdemeanors up through felonies. Um, so we have a mix of misdemeanor levels in these classes. Um, maybe not a felon, because a felony uh, domestic abuse is a mandatory uh, prison term in the state of Iowa. So they come to prison instead of um, go to probation in our state. Um, can you say a little bit about how the program design arrived at 24 weeks as far as um, how long people are in it for? I don't know. 24 weeks was um, the length of the previous program. So maybe that had something to do with it. 
I can find out for you. Um, I did, um, was the response of the justice system different for the active program than it was for the, the other programs or the control group? In other words, were they more active and they were uh, trying harder to ensure that people completed? Um, what were the differences? No, there was, if anything, in two judicial districts, the, um, in two areas, in two locations in two judicial districts, the active participants actually had a higher failure rate and people were run, trying to run around wondering why. But that failure rate was um, similar to the failure rate that nationally um, is often experienced in other domestic abuse programs. So before the active, they had kind of a lower than average recidivism or um, uh, dropout. dropout rate. Um, but no, um, uh, for the pilot, for the pilot, um, the, there were like mm, eight locations, six to eight locations that ran some Duluth classes, I mean some treatment as usual classes, and some active classes. Um, the, there was no random assignment, but only insofar as the men um, chose which time slots they wanted to take their classes in. So they self-selected themselves, not knowing which was which. They self-selected themselves into a time slot. So some of those time slots just happened to be running our treatment as usual, and other time slots happened to be running active. Um, my question was, uh, is regarding um, whether you've been able to implement this curriculum on other populations, uh, specifically in Latino, Hispanic, how, how does it play out when you have someone in your, in your group or is there specific groups for them and is it translated, acculturated, or what's, what's your experience on that? In some of our metropolitan areas, we have um, Spanish-speaking um, classes available. Um, I will need to ask whether any of those have um, gone over to active yet. Um, there were um, uh, individuals of um, uh, different uh, races and ethnicities in the active versus the treatment as usual group. Um, and uh, we can get those breakouts uh, for you um, to see, but yeah. Uh, you mentioned program outcomes on the one year recidivism, the two slides, are, were those your program outcomes? Um, yes, these are the preliminary uh, recidivism outcomes. Okay. And then the domestic assault um, section, is that coming from any new charge or how is that? Yes, any new charge in the district court from a lower level to a high level, okay. domestic so, abuse assault. Okay, so it was strictly on courts, um, any new charges being filed? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, those running the active program, were those people already that were facilitating groups in those areas that were th then just trained to that, or were those the researchers themselves? No, they were um, folks who had facilitated domestic violence programs, batteries education programs in the past, and they were to learn this new curriculum. Um, I remember um, we have uh, one of them, Roxanne Sheffert, in our central office now. She's a quality assurance specialist. And she described how in her area, when uh, they tried to take the active manual and just do it, and she said, oh, we hated active. We just didn't like it until they got their coach. And then when they got their coach, they, you know, they had an aha moment, and they just totally loved the curriculum after that. So this isn't something that you can just take and we would say, you know, don't just take it and try to run with it because I think the coaching element because of the, um, the difference in the philosophy and what goes on and the um, difference in facilitation, um, you need someone to help step you through it the first time and then you get it. How does your judiciary react to this type of program and was there any type of informational sessions or training or uh, sessions for the judiciary to understand the difference between the programs and how well received was that? Um, I know that the um, domestic abuse office of the judicial branch 
has been in, they were the ones who initiated this. And um, so we were working for them. So I, in our minds. So in, um, I don't know what, what informational sessions the judges were given. All I know is that we had to um, rename our program uh, to the Iowa Domestic Abuse Program because our criminal, we had to change our criminal code because it kept mentioning batteries education. And now we wanted to um, reference the Iowa Domestic Abuse Program in, in that. So I, I've only heard that they've been supportive of this research. Yes? So, so because you work so closely, so because you work so closely with the judiciary, um, were they super supportive, like if you reported people who weren't attending, or you, how you had a really close relationship, and, and was there a very consistent response? Um, our district departments of correctional services, being district-based, has always had a really good relationship with the district judges in their area. Um, it's a model where um, there's local some freedom at the local level to do what makes sense for the district and for the area, the local area. Um, not having a statewide umbrella to our correctional services allows folks to work things out at the local level, so which it, includes being, you know, requesting, you know, this person isn't doing well, the judge will say contempt of court, go serve a little bit in jail, and then we'll put you back in the program or whatever needs to happen. And how coordinated and collaborative are you with the service providers? and victim services and those kinds of things. You know, I, I guess I'm looking for how, how coordinated the community response is. Mm -hmm. um, for um, a lot of our state, the facilitators themselves are employees of the District Departments of Correctional Services. If they're not, um, and if they're contracting services, those contracts have been in places often for years and years, a long standing. Um, partnerships with um, the organizations that come in to do the treatment classes. But what about the victim services classes? I mean, not classes, the victim, the victim services, services organizations, the, like the domestic violence agencies that are in the area. How, how well do you work with them? I don't in know, but I will ask. Um, we have the Iowa Coalition Against Domestic Violence um, coordinator working with us at the statewide level. And um, I'll ask what happens um, at the local level. Just for example, if someone isn't attending or you find right. out the victim's not safe, right. is there a call to the victim services organization or how does that I work? I would hope that there's a safety plan and yeah, things in place. I know we have that for our um, electronic monitoring that um, we work very closely to keep the victim safe. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if it went through the facilitators did that, if, if maybe the, the probation officers did that or, or how, how that happened to make sure that the I'll victim ask. is safe. Great, thank you. I'd be very happy to ask. Um, so you spoke about how active uses, um, I think it said experiential learning. Can yes. you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Yes. Um, so the one uh, exercise that I know to describe is called the ice cube exercise. So everyone is handed an ice cube. After a while, after you hold a cold ice cube, you're supposed to, going to hold it until it melts, by the way. The men are going to hold that ice cube until it melts. After a while, that gets to be feeling very uncomfortable on your hand. Um, so there are different strategies the men you know, do. Are you going to um, switch it from hand to hand? You know, when your one hand gets too uncomfortable, switch it from hand to hand. Are you going to squeeze it harder in an attempt to make it melt faster so you get through the exercise um, faster? Um, what this exercise is, is an experience in learning to handle an uncomfortable situation. Uncomfortable mentally, a little uncomfortable physically, so you learn that you can get through an uncomfortable situation. It's not, you know, lectured to you, it's experienced. Does your curriculum address in any way if an offender, uh, that sort of uh, entitlement uh, concept or, you know, that, um, 
I'm the man of the house, the king of the castle, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Does it deal with that at all? Um, this curriculum is designed to address all of the contributors um, to uh, the behavior, the domestic violence behavior. So whether that um, contributor is attitudes about women, um, culturally specific, you know, attitudes, um, uh, frustration, lack of employment, you know, whatever those contributors are, this program addresses all of the contributors um, to uh, the men's behavior. Are those details about the program uh, available, like online or, you know, for someone to look at? Um, well, we have the curriculum books um, that uh, we uh, um, supplied to the task force ahead of time. Whatever questions you have that aren't in this facilitator's manual, uh, just let me know and we will get answers for those yeah, questions. We emailed out last week to all the curricula we emailed out last week. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you'll have a manual that describes all of the exercises and um, you know, the whole program, each of those 24 sessions, the lesson plans for each. And that's actually kind of the question I had. I, I know you try to have an emphasis on not, not shaming. You talked about even removing Better's intervention from the title. Reading through the curriculum, though, it almost seems like they go out of their way to not even talk about domestic violence. Like, those aren't even the issues used in the samples. There is um, absolutely a, a session about ways people um, can be hurtful. And there's a tremendous amount of discussion on ways people can be hurtful to others. Um, so that's, we, we don't avoid, we don't avoid. Because it um, just seems like that would be used in the examples throughout the book, at least, is to, to kind of direct that conversation. We're teaching um, skill building. We're teaching skill building and experience, um, having the um, men experience and learn and, and get it in their own minds. They come up with their own aha moments. Um, the facilitators aren't supposed to, like if we see a person struggling in class with learning the concept, um, there's specific instruction for the facilitator not to you know, tell the person that they should get it and how they should get it. They let that um, man sit there in the class and feel the uncomfortableness of not getting it. And because when someone gets it on their own and gets their own aha, then that becomes instilled in that man. It's, this, it's a way for men to get it and understand it on their own. And I understand that part. Yeah. I was just confused that that doesn't get built in to the curriculum though of addressing domestic violence. I mean, it is very globally aimed, which I, I guess leaves the door open to be able to discuss a, a ton of topics. Um, but just in terms of guidance for the facility here, it doesn't seem like it provides a lot of that. Hmm. I mean, I'm, and I haven't read it all, I'll be honest. Yeah. I'm, I'm halfway through. Yeah. Um, but other than the first session, domestic violence never gets talked about in the next 12. Okay. Any examples or, or anything. Hmm. Well, they know why they're there. We're teaching skills. Is there any difference in cost between the treatment as usual and the active treatment? No, there is not. Um, the same uh, number of facilitators, um, the same number of weeks. Um, it's just a different curriculum. But to ramp up the active program, was there an additional allocation of funding from the legislature or anybody other judiciary in order to get all the facilitators, the training underway so that they are active trained to do that program? Um, well, I know there was a, the VAWA grant um, and so that's probably it then. That's probably it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But a lot of our training was other facilitators being trained to facilitate. And since a lot of the facilitators are our staff, um, we don't charge our own staff to train our staff. Yeah. So just to kind of help me understand the numbers that we're looking at, 
Um, how, when, how long ago are these numbers from? Is this the original group or? No, no, this is a much larger sample from okay. the original um, group, the original pilot. Um, so there were, oh, this could be a three, a three year period um, that ended in uh, December of 2013. So, okay, so even though it was the, they were followed for an 18 month, potentially an 18 month period, mm -hmm. the actual research timeline was three years? So, Is that what you're right, saying? Right, no, the sample. Uh -huh. So we cut the um, sample of men off in December of 2013 uh -huh. to allow for that extra year of follow up through December of 2014. Okay. Yeah. This is kind of an observation. I mean, I, f I feel like sort of the conversation about curriculums is that the clinical world, and I think about domestic violence offending and sexual offending, like particularly like juvenile offenders, mm -hmm. has a certain way of understanding the approach, and it involves a lot of mindfulness and a lot of sort of emotional regulation and those like emotional literacy, kind of increasing those kinds of skills. The social justice world really wants to say word, words like domestic violence, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and call it what it is. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as we're looking as a group, I mean, we're, this is a big moment right now for New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and the state, and the country, I feel like, and globally. The universe, how far out do I wanna go? It's a, it, so, and in saying that, I feel like, um, we have like programs that swing towards more of a clinical model and ones that really want to stay rooted in that social justice language and the way that they approach the problem. Um, so I'm wondering a little bit how much you know about your state and as far as how that really lands in a community where they're, you know, as far as coming in um, and working with programs to change from the treatment as usual model mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the active model. Mm -hmm. And was that out of, because I feel like right now, and I guess I'm on camera and being recorded, but you know, because people are really wanting to see results, they're wanting to see financially, you know, how, what's the impact on the correctional system, those kinds of things. Um, I feel like moving forward, we're kind of in a place of reactivity versus like really slow planned over 20 years, how are we all gonna do this together? And so I worry that like a program that seems like it's a little lower is gonna get swept away because look at these numbers. And then another program is gonna come in with look at these numbers. And so how do we really know while we're in a place of reactivity, kind of trying to gain ground and prove the need for batterers intervention or preserve mm -hmm. the space and the money for those things? Mm -hmm. um, how do you, I'm curious about your state, not just about the programming, but your state and how that really yeah. Does that make sense, the it question? Does. Okay, it, it does. Um, and the facilitators in two of our judicial districts who had been teaching our treatment as usual yeah. and very committed yeah. to teaching domestic violence, um, domestic abusers, they came forward and helped to design this curriculum. The copyrights being held by the University of Iowa as well as mm -hmm. two of our judicial district departments of correctional services they were self-motivated mm -hmm. to um, help design a curriculum in hopes that we could get better outcomes. But mm -hmm. and everyone wants fewer victims. Absolutely. Everyone mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. um, I also shared a story a little earlier about um, Roxanne Shepherd, who is in another area of the state, and they were like, active, what? Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. don't like this. Mm -hmm. We don't like this at all. And uh, then they got their coach, and they were like, oh, we really like this. So there was um, some questioning in other areas of the state. And now 80% of our state is doing the active, they have stopped treatment as usual. Um, because they, um, and you know, these are facilitators. So it's not just because of the numbers. It's because of what they see in people. So because that kind of gained ground, was there any um, incentivizing as far as funding streams or were people concerned about not doing treatment as usual because of that or there was, no. it was really just a choice? There wasn't anything else that was driving that? Yes, it was a choice. It was a choice. Mm -hmm. It caught on um, and it kept catching on and um, people really, and the facilitators really liked what was happening mm -hmm. in their classes. 
a question about funding. Is there just one funding stream for batter's intervention, like through Department of Corrections, or is there something else? How does that work? So the eight judicial district departments of correctional services receive pass-through funding uh, from uh, the state legislature through the Department of Corrections through purchase of service agreements. In most areas of the state, all that is, you know, budget cuts, right? All that is anymore is it pretty much just pays for your staff. So local money and offender chargebacks um, end up paying for um, a lot of this, the treatment. You know, there's very little um, money left over after you pay your staff anymore from the state appropriation. So there are, and it's done in probably eight different ways because we have eight judicial districts and they all do their own thing. Um, but yeah. Um. So I appreciate what you're saying about people know why they're there, right? Um, but in my experience, there's quite a bit of denial, right, and minimization mm -hmm. around that and blaming other people's actions. So is that something that's sort of more of like a slower buildup to understanding that once they gain the skills, or are you working with them to be accountable to that from day one? Because I'm not sure how you're... Because it does look like domestic violence is somewhat absent in some of those earlier. I can't read it all that well. Yeah, I know. So, is it so, so emotion regulation skills, feeling hopeless, yeah. control is the problem, yeah. willingness is an alternative, and understanding emotions. Yeah. So this um, gets through the denial of emotions. Mm -hmm. Um, cognitive skills, understanding your thoughts and responding to your thoughts, parts one and two. So just to help me understand what that might look like in a group, and thank you for all the, no. the, all the questions, but um, so are they talking, when, are those, are they, do they use examples from their life that are self-selected? Are they guided to use examples of abuse in their life? What does that really look like in session? I will have to ask since okay. I have not observed okay. Um, okay. a class. Thank you. I've been around people that. Thanks. I will now. I don't know, maybe this has been asked before, but what kind of uh, victim involvement did you have with this? Were they consulted or surveys or feedback? Do the um, Iowa Coalition on Domestic Violence was part of the planning um, and implementation um, and continues to be involved in the active train, yeah, in this curriculum. The victims. I don't know. I'll ask. I definitely will ask. What are the requirements as a facilitator? Um, if it's not in the manual, we'll get that answer for you. Someone had asked that once before, and I want you to have that answer. They definitely have to go through the training. Um, but requirements um, previous to that, what prerequisites, um, I'll get that for you. Yes? Is, is there a certification? I thought I read at one point that there's some sort of a, a certification process that facilitators had to go through. Does that sound They right? must go through the training. And they must, there's um, a requirement that they um, do um, a certain number of, of classes and with a coach that they, they are observed, they receive feedback from the coach um, to help um, make sure that they're delivering the curriculum uh, with fidelity. And, and then after that process, there's a certain number of coaching sessions you have to go through. Um, and then, yeah, you're certified. So is the program in any other states yet? I'm sorry that I don't know that. We are going to Vermont mm -hmm. um, to uh, do facilitator training there. And so then how does the coaching process work from there or as far as maintaining fidelity once you start? The coaches will either have to travel or there is a way to do um, coaching remotely. Okay. Which we're doing in some, um, you know, remote parts. I guess not, all, not a lot of Iowa is remote, but there are some travel issues that we're surmounting by, um, you know, uh, electronic means of coaching. Do you do any uh, follow-up? After the completion, and what is it? Um, the follow-up uh, on the men. Um, there 
is um, in, again, eight judicial districts, eight ways of doing things. Some of the districts, I know of one in particular, has a batter's education aftercare component that is active. Um, for others, it may just be the reality that after you complete your court-ordered hours, you've completed your court-ordered hours. Um, we can get a, I'll get a, a, a description of what goes on on that. Um, and uh, recognize that there are many offenders who go through this, these classes who have no supervision to us. They are simply being, um, you know, they're required to go take the classes. And if they graduate, we have no legal um, tie to that offender. They're not on our formal supervision. So for some people, going through the class is all they get. So if you're going, if most of, the, most of the state is going to this approach and you have the preliminary findings, how are you going to measure effectiveness over time, see if you could replicate these results? Because now you're going to have a skewed, a skewed end. Um, skewed in that there is no comparison group right, anymore. Right, right, right. Right, yes. We've had to tell um, Amy Zarling that continuation of her research will need to be in jurisdictions that don't have it. So we were her one-shot deal for um, piloting um, in the state of Iowa. Um, it would not be in our best interests to participate in any other study where we're going to be made to tr you know, go back to our business as usual. How can they now? How can a facilitator now? It's not ethical. Now been, That's the problem with evidence-based. It's not a good based, idea. Right. They're already trained and active. And our, there are, facilitators tend to become very committed to active. Um, that it would just kill us to, you know, participate in any further research. The research that is now getting started right now um, is um, um, self-report, uh, um, pre-test, mid-test, post-test of the men. Traditional. Yeah, but, They're going mm -hmm. to um, do a validated um, checklist uh, that measures uh, there are levels of aggression, pre-program, mid-program, and post-program. Mm -hmm. So that'll be um, the last study uh, in Iowa. So it's going back to traditional means of studying it. So you're not doing the comparison groups anymore. Um, there is just enough comparison group with our treatment as usual that those men will also be given the, um, the checklist for <coughs> levels of aggression. So there will be some comparison between the levels of aggression of active men and the levels of aggression pre, mid, and post for the, the remaining um, uh, sites that are doing the treatment as usual. And I guess they'll control for the difference in the number in each I group. assume so. Okay. Amy Zarling is a very thorough researcher. Okay, thank you. It seems like the, the setup is more of a, a classroom type of setup as opposed to a group. Um, in my experience in running groups, people can kind of drift towards the edges. Is there anything that, that absolutely mandates that they do certain things throughout the program or, or just ways to kind of force more involvement? Since it is experiential, they have to participate you know, in the ice cube exercise. There's no way you can just sit back and not say anything and not do anything. and because then you're not really participating in class. Um, so because of the experiential nature of um, active, um, it um, ensures that the men are participating actively. They have to. Thanks, buddy.